Thanks, Simon. Thanks for hosting us. Good evening to all the listeners. My name is Ross Beckley. I'm a Chief Investment Officer at High Street Asset Management, founded by an industry veteran in Michael Patchett back in 2011. We are offshore specialists, ideally suited to clients looking to internationally diversify their wealth. We proudly boast a highly driven investment team with a blend of qualified youngsters and experienced statesmen at the helm. High Street is owner managed, we are approachable and invested alongside our clients. With me is another Ross, Ross Yaman. To avoid confusion during the presentation, uh, he'll be now referred to as Yam. Yam heads our research department and is involved in the managing of our AMCs, an acronym for Actively Managed Certificates, which will be the subject for today's presentation. He'll be delivering the presentation and I'll pitch in occasionally just to make sure the investment offering of these structures is not lost when explaining exactly what an AMC is. Before I hand over, I would uh, briefly like to introduce you to our investment offering. Each fund or product that we manage was crafted to meet our clients' needs, which weren't being addressed by the local investment industry. As such, we believe we have a differentiated fund and product offering. Our funds have established track records, while the AMCs are a relatively new initiative, which, are, we've, which we are excited to introduce to you today. Firstly, on the left-hand side, our international offerings. We offer two USD-denominated uh, unit trusts listed in Ireland. Firstly, the Global Balance Fund is for moderate risk clients targeting superior risk adjusted returns by mitigating large market drawdowns. On the bottom left, Wealth Warriors is a thematic fund invested in companies benefiting from innovation and resulting changes in consumer behavior. As an example, two of our highest conviction themes in that fund are cybersecurity and semiconductors. On to the right, our, the first of our local offerings was designed for retirement savings, seeking to maximize offshore exposure and minimize local risk. This fund has a 90% plus RAND hedge exposure, which is significantly more than anything we have come across in the market thus far. Finally, on to today's offering, an actively managed certificate listed on the JSE, which prioritizes yield received from offshore companies in the form of dividends and share buybacks. I will now hand over to Yam, who will explain the structure of these AMCs. Okay, and then just I reiterate Ross's thanks. Thank you, Simon, for having us. Um, I think as Simon mentioned, uh, AMCs came to the JSC at the end of last year. Uh, they've generated a hell of a lot of excitement, um, and there's been lots written about them, um, with lots more banks coming online and, and issuing more and more of these, these kind of certificates. Um, but in all the media that we see and in all the writings that happens, it often comes across as being very, very complicated, um, when in fact that, that doesn't have to be the case. Um, for, for the investor who, who has seen a whole bunch of difficult lingo um, surrounding these kind of products, um, what you'll be relieved to hear is that they actually share a lot of similarities with other collective investment schemes, which you may have come across. Um, and if you've ever traded any kind of a share um, on the JSC, there's lots of similarities in, in the way that, that these instruments trade as well. So um, getting on to the first similarity between an actively managed certificate um, and other collective investment schemes is uh, what they can be invested in. Um, interestingly, because uh, actively managed certificates are classified as inward listings on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, uh, we can invest in a wide range of assets um, and we're not restricted by any sort of rules or regulations uh, that, that keep certain amounts of funds uh, or certain percentages of, of any one certificate in South Africa. Um, so we can invest in both uh, local and foreign equities, uh, local and foreign fixed income instruments, as well as other um, listed instruments such as warrants or, or even ETFs. Um, when we talk about the stakeholders um, and, and sort of getting into the mechanics of how one of these AMCs works, um, the most important stakeholder, which is no doubt a, a potential investor, um, how, how do these work for investors? Um, well, AMCs trade on the JC in a very similar way to the way a share does. Um, they trade with daily liquidity, and, and so investors have the ability to buy and sell these things um, on a daily basis. Uh, in, in return for investing in the actively managed certificate, uh, what the investor receives is the performance of the underlying, and um, less any fees due. 
Um, in terms of other stakeholders, and an important stakeholder, given the fact that an actively managed certificate is a structured note, um, is the issuing bank. Uh, in our case, for the AMC that we manage, uh, the issuing bank is Standard Bank, um, but there are a wide range of banks who have, have issued AMCs on, on the JSC um, and got them listed. What role does uh, the issuing bank play? Uh, first of all, they are the certificate issuer, um, but importantly, they are also the market maker. Uh, what does that mean? Simply put, they are the people who ensure that the, the investors can trade this on a daily basis um, and can trade it at that day's net asset value. And the final stakeholder, um, which in this case is us in high street asset management, is the investment manager. And in the same way as it would work in a unit trust, um, we are responsible for managing the portfolio of underlying securities, um, making sure that we stick to the mandate that we've set out to, to, to produce. We think we've created something quite exciting um, for, with our particular AMC. But as I said, there are a whole range of these that have been listed in recent times. And so different investment managers will have different mandates um, and it is their responsibility to, to stick to those mandates over time. Um, so what makes AMCs different and why are they relevant to you? Um, there is a plethora of offerings that investors have the ability to, to, to invest in um, in South Africa. So why would you invest in an AMC as opposed to one of these other offerings that exists? Um, we, don't know, we don't know who created um, AMCs, the first one, um, but whoever did, I would imagine that they created them with both retail and institutional investors in mind. Um, they really do um, provide a, a key tool, I think, going forward for both of those uh, types of investor. Um, as I said, it's classified as an inward listing, which allows offshore exposure without the use of an individual's discretionary allowance. Um, we are going to show you our, our full portfolio a little bit later on. Um, and what you'll see there is that we can get you access through these instruments uh, to some of the world's most exciting equities. Uh, we can get you access to Apple and Microsoft and Google and all sorts of these exciting companies um, with your hard-earned rands. You don't have to take that money offshore. And, and use your discretionary allowance, which, which is a big differentiator for, for actively managed certificates. Um, it also gives investors access to, to actively managed mandates. I mean, Simon is probably way more versed in this than I am, but in terms of uh, collective schemes that have existed on the JSC historically, um, the vast majority of them have been passive in nature. And so what actively managed certificates do um, is they give you access to guys like High Street Asset Management and, and a whole range of others and, and the active strategies that they are employing um, on, on the day-to-day -day basis. And then finally, um, they are remarkably easy to, to trade. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you've ever traded a, a share on the JSC, um, your experience in trading these instruments will be, um, will be very, very similar. So it, there's no use just saying that. Um, often we, we, we have met with clients um, who have become frustrated with the level of paperwork that they have to do um, to get a, a certain investment done. Um, and so I wanted to give you a, a real example today of, of, of how this would work. So if we can pretend that Simon is, is the investor here, um, what does Simon have to do to invest in, in, in an actively managed certificate? And hopefully it'll be ours. So I'm gonna use Standard Bank as, as the example here. Um, so Simon uh, has an active brokerage account. What he does is he contacts his broker and instructs the broker to purchase the certificate. Importantly, that is where Simon's duties are finished. There is nothing left for him to do. Once he's contacted the broker and instructed him to purchase, um, Simon's broker will then contact Standard Bank in our case, but it is the issuing bank in the case of other AMCs, um, and, and, and he buys the certificate at net asset value. Uh, the next step from there is that the certificates are transferred into Simon's custody account um, with whatever the brokerage rate um, that is charged by, by Simon's specific broker. Um, it obviously works directly in reverse when we come to the selling side of things, but that is how easy it is. Um, and for the average retail investor, the mom and pop at home, um, I, I think that sort of system uh, is significantly easier than what, we, than what they may have experienced with some of the other schemes that they've gone into um, in their short investing lives. Um, I'll now pass back on to Ross, um, who before I introduce our actively managed certificate, um, AMC002. Um, Ross is just going to give you a brief outline of how we at High Street select the securities um, that make up the, the, the portfolios that we invest in. Thanks, Yam. Um, the AM, before I introduce, uh, uh, Yam introduces the AMC002, which uh, sounds very Bond-like. Um, I'd like to provide insights into our investment me uh, methodology, which forms the backbone of our AMC's investment objective. 
I'll be brief, uh, but if it resonates with any investors out there, we welcome you to come in to find out more. So what fundamentals do we look for in an investment? Our preferences are no different from that of a small business owner. We see companies with sustainable revenue growth uh, operating at industry leading margins. Uh, this combination is most prevalent in companies that have a competitive edge. Hard evidence of this can be found in the company's return on capital metrics. So typically we favor companies with high return on capital, uh, significantly above their cost of capital. Um, also a strong financial position gives the company the best chance uh, to generate compounding returns for shareholders. Just as any business owner will know, school fees cannot be paid with paper profits or put another way, checkbooks of the past, which may or, not, may or may not bounce. The cornerstone of our investment process focuses on the cash generated by a company. It is these compounding cash flows that we aim to purchase at a reasonable price. A company, uh, once uh, cash is generated, a company may elect to allocate these cash flows to a variety of purposes. Firstly, management on the top right there may elect to fund future operations. History shows that this often fails to deliver on the expected returns and while this should not rule out all growth focused companies, the more defensive investor should favor management allocating capital elsewhere. This brings us to our second option available to management, which is to pay down debt. As I alluded to earlier, uh, the companies in which the product is invested are generally very well capitalized, meaning that the cash can ultimately be distributed to shareholders, either by way of a dividend or through share buybacks, cumulatively referred to as the shareholder yield, as shown by the two dark blue bubbles on the bottom right. Um, as Yam will detail later, this yield component has generated the bulk of returns over time, as opposed to those genera generated by capital uh, appreci appreciation. Um, and patient shareholders uh, will benefit from this yield. Now over to Yam uh, to dig into more detail. Okay, so now that we've gone through the mechanics of an AMC and the basics of hard work, um, for, for those of you who may be seeing AMCs for the first time, um, there may still be a few little holes in your understanding. Um, we're now gonna go through our actively managed certificate, the one where we are the investment manager and, and Standard Bank are, are the product issuer. And, and I'm hoping during that process by using an actual example, we may be able to, to plug some of those holes. Um, so yeah, AMC002, which is the high street offshore yielding product. Um, in terms of the stakeholders I've just mentioned, uh, Standard Bank is uh, the, the product issuer. Um, I think it's very important that we, we do get this across and we are very open about the fact that because uh, actively managed certificates are structured notes, um, and in our case it exists um, on Standard Bank's structured note program, that does mean that you are taking Standard Bank credit risk. Um, when we were seeking a, a partner to, to launch one of these with, um, the credit risk with Standard Bank was something that we were very comfortable with. Um, and so that shouldn't be a problem, but uh, credit risk is something that you do need to consider when investing in actively managed certificates. Uh, we are the investment manager here at High Street Asset Management, um, and it's listed as an inward listing on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So I told you that uh, the AMC002 was a differentiated offering. What makes it differentiated? Uh, first of all, it has more than 95% direct offshore exposure, um, which is exclusively focused on, on offshore equities and listed property. Um, how can we do that? Um, as mentioned, that's because of the status as an inward listing um, of, of an AMC. It allows us to invest pretty much where we would like to, um, and we believe uh, that, that, that we want as much offshore as possible. Uh, I'll detail some, some further motivations for that in a second. Um, the product focuses on international companies, um, which are providing substantial yield. Uh, we consider yield as the summation of dividends and share buybacks. Um, I'll, I will dig into the validity of, of dividends and share buybacks also a little bit later, um, and as to why we think they are so important um, in terms of overall returns. Uh, we are trying to employ a, a very defensive strategy, um, which emphasizes companies with, with strong balance sheets um, and, and who have industry leading profitability. Um, and now that the product's been put together, um, we have made sure that, that, we are, that we are comfortable with how diversified it is 
uh, both from a sectoral as, as well as a geographical uh, perspective. So why do we have 95% plus um, of, of the product invested directly offshore? Um, if you have a look at the chart on the right hand side there, you'll see that since democracy in South Africa, the rand has uh, depreciated by 6% per annum against the US dollar. Uh, that's a very strong trend line. Um, and that means that since then, South Africans have lost 6% of their purchasing power um, annually. Um, although we can't profess to be able to tell you where we think the RAND will be in, in 6, 12 or, or 18 months time with all the exogenous factors that exist, um, we are very firm believers that for South Africans who have uh, their hard assets in RANDs, their, their houses valued in RANDs, their cars valued in RANDs, uh, they get paid this annual salary in RANDs, um, that probably all of their investments should not be uh, in RANDs. And so this is a product which we've created to get um, investors exposure um, to the offshore markets um, without having to have to use their discretionary allowance. Uh, just to speak to the, the chart on the left, we do have a big uh, weighting towards uh, dollar denominated companies. And um, I, I think the answer to, to why that is the case is fairly simple. And um, within the universe of high yield uh, paying companies, um, we see immense opportunity in the United States. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that all of those companies earn all of their money um, in, in America. Um, a lot of the companies that we're investing in are large blue chip multinational companies who, who earn their revenues in, in a whole variety, a wide variety of geographies. And so um, I, I wouldn't get distracted by the fact that there are so many uh, dollar denominated companies there. Um, and then there is 4%, uh, which is in RANDs. Um, that is just from a, a liquidity perspective. We need to make sure that we have enough cash on hand to be able to deal with um, if anybody sells any certificates on any given day. Uh, secondly, um, I, I mentioned that the product is very well diversified, um, both sectorally and geographically. Um, I think if you have a look at the, the chart on the left hand side there, you'll see that we are invested across a wide variety of sectors, um, probably to speak to the biggest and the smallest. Um, Pharmaceuticals is our biggest weight at this point in time. Um, why is that the case? I think quite a lot of that has happened um, pretty naturally. We, we, a couple of our, our pharmaceutical majors have gone on quite nice runs recently. Um, and, and so that's why they, they, they've accumulated a bigger weight in the product. And then all the way to the smallest one, uh, given what's happened in the world in the last couple of months, we've been pretty relieved not to have too much exposure to banks. Um, you'll see when you have a look across our holdings on the right hand side there that we only hold one bank, uh, that being Morgan Stanley, um, and we are pretty comfortable that Morgan Stanley's business model um, is, is largely differentiated from the banks who are, who are running into, into trouble um, in, in recent times. Um, Simon, I think we, we can speak to this at the end, but I, I'm not sure how many asset managers come onto your show um, and are, are willing to open up and, and show all of their holdings, um, but what we've come to experience is that our investors or our prospective investors want to know what they are investing in. Um, and so that's why we have no problem. Those are our holdings um, as of this morning. Um, you will see a lot of American flags there. I, I've mentioned why that's the case, but there, there, there are a few things in common between all of those companies there. Uh, one, they are generating enormous amounts of, of, of free cash flow. Uh, two, they have relatively defensive balance sheets. And then most importantly, they are distributing a significant amounts of capital back to shareholders in the form of dividends and share buybacks. So to speak to dividends, uh, why do we view dividends as important? Um, why are they such a big part of the, of the total return framework? Um, in the chart in front of you, uh, what we have charted is the S&P 500 uh, against the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats Index. Uh, to be considered a dividend aristocrat, you have to uh, increase your dividend for 25 years uh, consecutively or more. Um, and so there are about 67 companies within the S&P 500 that make up that index. Um, and that is a large part of our investable universe for this product. Um, when you chart it since the, the turn of the century, uh, what you'll see is that the dividend aristocrat index has, has quite widely outperformed um, by a factor of more than 600%. Um, and that really does show the compounding value of dividends. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we view dividends as being so important over long periods of time. Why do we see dividend paying companies um, outperform over long periods of time? Um, in, in large part, it's because during negative times in the cycle, uh, dividend paying companies become relatively attractive. Uh, to speak to the chart on the left there, you'll see that since 1926, um, that, that this is a chart from Capital Group, since 1926, 38% um, of your total return has come from dividends. 
Now, for the average investor who sees that the dividend yield on the S&P 500 is 1.7%, it's very hard to conceptualize the fact that over time, um, through market cycles and using the power of compounding, um, that dividends will make up that large part of total return. But they do, <laughs> um, and, and that is one of the reasons why, why, why we are so, so bullish on, on dividend stocks going forward. Um, I, I mentioned the fact that dividend stocks look attractive during negative periods. Um, if I could draw your attention to the, the 2000s there, um, had you invested uh, at the beginning of 2000, at the beginning of the decade, um, you actually would have lost money come 2010 um, after the dot-com bubble and the global financial crisis. Um, but the portion of your total return, um, which came from dividends, remained positive. Um, and so even in negative times, when companies are struggling with earnings um, or they're in really difficult parts of the cycle, um, these high quality dividend payers maintain their dividends and, and continue to grow them over time. Um, and, and that's why during negative times, and if you've listened to any financial news in the last couple of months, um, there are some guys who, who are not very positive on how the next few months are gonna look. Um, it's during negative times where, where high dividend paying stocks begin to look attractive. Uh, finally, just to round off a little section on dividends, um, is to speak to two of our, our pharmaceutical majors um, who, who have done really nice for us, um, who have done really nicely for us in recent times. Um, if I can speak to the charts on the left-hand side, uh, the blue bars speak to the earnings per share of a company in any one quarter, um, whilst the orange line indicates the, the dividends that they're paying out per share. Um, and what you'll see is that even though AbbVie has returned 19% per annum since 2013, and Merck on the bottom has returned 13% per annum since 2013, they have gone through some difficult times um, where earnings have turned negative. During those difficult times, however, they have managed to continue to pay the dividend because of the safety of the balance sheet and because of the level of free cash flows that they are being able to create. Importantly to us is, is we don't want to see our companies cutting dividends um, and neither of these two have cut their dividends since they began paying them. Um, to turn to the other side of yield, uh, we've spoken to dividends now. So now to speak to buybacks, um, share buybacks are a topic which has uh, largely split the academic community. Um, but we, as you'll see alongside Warren Buffett at the bottom of the slide, um, believe that they are hugely accretive to shareholders um, and that they are becoming a more and more important part of the total return framework. Um, so what is a share buyback for those who, who, who aren't as well versed? Um, it's a corporate action whereby the company uses the cash that it has on hand um, and it repurchases its own shares on the open market. Um, in most cases, companies will then cancel these shares, um, therefore decreasing the amount of shares outstanding um, of the company that, that, that exists on, on any register. So why is this important? How does this work? Well, because the amount of shares that are, that are outstanding is decreasing, it, it leads to very strong anti-dilutionary effects, which increases the earnings per share um, to each individual shareholder or to each remaining shareholder. Um, and lowers the PE ratio. So I suppose that is the first, um, the first big benefit, big benefit towards uh, share buybacks. And secondly, it, it has a very strong signaling effect. Um, if Tim Cook at Apple, and we're going to show you Apple in a little second, decides that the most attractive investment that, that he can find um, is Apple, um, we, 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 it's a great signal to the to the world about the financial health of that particular company. Um, and so the signaling effect of of strong, consistent share buyback programs is really powerful as well. Um, so again, we showed you the dividend aristocrats against the S&P 500. It's only fair that we keep consistent and we show you uh, the S&P 500 against the S&P 500 buyback index um, over a variety of periods of time. Um, immediately when I look at that chart, uh, my eyes are drawn down to the 20 year return um, and a very strong outperformance that we see from the buyback index against the S&P 500. Um, why is that the case? It's because companies who have the ability to consistently buy back large amounts of shares, um, one must have very strong balance sheets, and second must be producing large nominal amounts and consistently growing uh, the, their cash flows year over year. Um, so that's why uh, th these companies have tended to outperform. Finally, with buybacks, in the same way we did with dividends, um, we're going to show you the two poster childs of buybacks that, that, that exist within uh, AMC002. Um, firstly, uh, to, to speak to Apple, um, if we have a look at the chart there, the, the gray line shows the, the shares outstanding of the company. And you'll see that at, since the, the program began in 2012, um, they have consistently been decreasing that share count. And the blue line you'll see there is uh, the share price. 
and, and, and what you'll see there is, is obviously very persistent for performance from one of the, the markets all time out performance. Um, when we look at, at the nominal amount of shares and the dollar amount that, that Apple have spent on share buybacks over time, it, it's quite a remarkable figure. They, they've spent more than half a trillion dollars buying back their own stock, um, which if, if you were to turn that into a company, um, they would fit in the top 10 of a company on the S&P 500, which, which is just quite remarkable. Um, that $556 billion that they've spent has allowed them to decrease the share count by a factor of 40%. Um, and I think this is a very important thing and is a question we get a lot um, when speaking to people about the benefits of share buybacks. Um, and that is that, but if they're spending all of their money buying back their own shares, what about the other necessary business functions? Um, and, and the plain answer to that is in the case of Apple and with Lowe's, is they are producing so much free cash flow that this um, share buyback program is happening after all the other necessary business expenses. So Apple is still consistently spending more than $20 billion a year on, on R&D, and their sales and marketing hasn't really decreased yet. Um, and so this is not, the share buybacks are not happening in place of other necessary business functions, um, but rather they're happening in supplement to shareholders and to return cash to, to, to loyal shareholders such as ourselves. Uh, the second poster child of, of share buybacks that, that, that we hold is Lowe's. Um, obviously, Lowe's ha has spent a, a nominally lower figure um, at, at 70 billion on buybacks, um, but their program did start a lot earlier in the early 2000s. And, and since they began the program, they've been able to decrease their share count by a factor of 62%. Um, since they started doing that, um, return on invested capital has more than doubled. Um, so here are two companies which have performed very, very well. Uh, they've been long-term winners for us. Uh, not Apple, but Lowe's is a company which we've held in, in a whole bunch of high streets products for a very long time. Um, and the share buyback has been a large reason for that. And one of the large motivating factors behind why, why, why we've held this company. Um, On to the, the final sort of aspect and, and the final characteristics that we are looking for um, in the companies which we are purchasing to, to put in AMC002. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is, is the business defensive? Um, so if we look at, at these two companies here, both of which are core holdings of ours within this product, um, Procter & Gamble are in the middle column and Nestle on the right-hand column, what you'll see is one, it's a nominally large business. Uh, a $350 billion market cap is a very big business. And um, those max drawdowns are, are, are really incredible figures. Um, although initially you might look at a 25% a drawdown for Procter & Gamble and you think, oh, that's actually quite big to lose um, a quarter of your, of, of your share value. If you have a look, at the average drawdown of the S&P 500 um, constituents over the last 10 years, that comes down to a figure of 52%, um, the average maximum drawdown. And so 20% for Nestle and 25% for Procter & Gamble is less than half of that. Um, and I think when people speak about defensiveness and they speak about um, defensive business models and a company's moat, et cetera, it, it's all good and well to say those things, but when times get really tough, um, does the share price react in a defensive manner? Um, and for these two companies, we really have seen the share prices react in defensive manner, um, and, and that's right through all sorts of crises. Um, from a net debt to bid dollar ratio uh, perspective, we are we are very comfortable with uh, the nominal levels of debt that all of our companies hold. Um, we look at the interest payments uh, and the coverage on those interest payments very regularly. Um, that is something that we are currently monitoring. Um, but the current nominal levels of debt which our companies carry we are very comfortable with. From a dividend yield perspective, uh, these two companies are, are serial cash flow producers um, and they are returning significant amounts of, of free cash flow back to us. Um, Procter & Gamble, uh, what is that, a 7% total yield, 2.5% uh, from the dividend uh, and 4.5% from share buybacks. Um, Nestle with a 2.6% dividend yield and they do buyback shares and um, we just haven't had an official announcement from management yet. So um, we, we didn't have a figure to put in there. So finally, we've gone through all of these things. We, we have made sure we're picking defensive companies. We are trying to pick high yielding companies. What has this resulted in when we, when, when we look at the, the portfolio as a whole? Um, so looking at the portfolio as a whole, we do have about a half a percent um, advantage on the S&P 500 from a total yield perspective. I think some of you after now watching me rant on about dividends and share buybacks might say, well, that's not really that big a total yield advantage for you. But I think what's important to talk about here is that the dividend companies and the share buyback companies that we are trying to buy, we are really trying to buy quality over quantity. 
Um, so if a company is paying well, off too much of a yield that we do not believe is sustainable, we don't want to be investing in those companies. Um, and, and we really want to be going for as high quality companies as we possibly can. From a, from a debt perspective, we write in line with the index. Um, again, I think our interest payments would, uh, sorry, the coverage on our interest payments would, would, would beat the index by quite a long way, um, but we largely align with where the S&P 500 is today. Um, we are, uh, to, to a large extent, more profitable though, um, and I think that's very important. What we are trying to uh, pick here are, are companies who have industry-leading profitability, um, and we've managed to do that. We don't only want that, we want that profitability to, to, to eventually go through the whole way in, in, into cash flow, um, we have seen that happen, um, and we are continually, on a daily basis, monitoring uh, the sustainability of, of those margins. But, but it is good for us to be um, significantly more profitable than, than what the index is. Um, and then finally, from a valuation perspective, um, less than five, you, you can get all of these stronger fundamentals, which we believe we have picked, and we are spending day to day making sure that, 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 that we've got, um, and you can get it for a, for a price which is relatively similar to that of the S&P 500. So that is our differentiated offering. Uh, that, that is what we spent a lot of time uh, alongside the guys at Standard Bank trying to produce. Um, and, and so before I sort of conclude, um, let's just go over AMC002, um, what, it, what it is and, and, and why we think it's different. So um, AMC002 is backed by the credit quality of Standard Bank um, and it's issued as a part of their very large structured note program. Um, we, are, we, we are the product manager. Um, and we specialize uh, at High Street in, in mitigating South African specific risk, finding our investors offshore exposure, um, and that's all based upon a, a, a strong research team um, who, who base our research on fundamentals. Um, the product offers exposure to some of the world's best global multinational companies listed on international exchanges with proven track records. Um, it's RAND denominated. You can get access to all of these um, offshore companies with your hard-earned RANDs. Um, you don't have to use your discretionary allowance and it's tradable with daily liquidity on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Um, and then finally, it's classified as an inward listing, which allows you, you, you access to all of these international markets without the limitations of exchange controls. So um, Simon, that is, that, that, that is our presentation. Um, we'd welcome any questions or if there's any holes that exist in anyone's understanding, um, or if you yourself have any questions about the mandate and what we're trying to do, why we think we're different, um, we'd welcome any of those questions. Perfect. Thanks, gents. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions coming in already. Folks, if you've got more questions, uh, drop them into the Q&A box. Uh, a, a bunch from Brandon. I'm going to, Brandon, I'm going to merge some of your questions because they're similar-ish. You're asking how the AMC and Smart BTF, Beta ETF is different. Uh, to my mind, that's just the active versus passive. Versus the Smart Beta ETF is just, it's a bunch of rules, as you say. Um, and then you're saying, you know, why not just get the the uh, dividend aristocrat ETF instead of this again, it's that rules based. It's it's the the passive nature versus the the active nature. Uh, another question: Are DF, DFM's currently right, using? If I, sorry, Ross. Yeah. So, so, just in terms of of dividends, why not just buy the dividend aristocrat index? Um, there are other AMC's that exist. Um, I, I won't be able to pull them right off the top of my head right now. Um, that's strictly focused on dividends. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that our focus on both dividends and share buybacks is what makes us different here. Okay. So I, I hear Brandon's point. If the if the dividend aristocrat index has done so well, why wouldn't we just buy that? Well, we're trying to invest in a little bit more than that. Um, we believe share buybacks are, are really accretive um, and, and add to the, the, the attractiveness of a high dividend paying company. More from Brandon asking around uh, DFMs. Uh, are, are, are you seeing any any interest from DFMs? I mean, I know that it's early days. I, you, what you listed, I think, the week before Christmas was it about. First yeah, first of December we listed, so it's okay. very new. <laughs> yeah, so as a firm, we've we've got a little bit over a billion rand under management, so we're still quite small in the greater scheme of things. Um, and which comes first, the chicken or the egg? So we feel we have to reach that uh, critical mass size. <laughs> We feel we've got the processes in place. Um, we are busy, uh, what these over the last couple of years, we, we spent a lot of time enhancing our process um, so we can be fit um, to meet the due diligence that, that accompanies a, a DFM um, uh, meeting. Um, so I think that ultimately is the way to go. And I think uh, importantly, the DFM has to be able to access um, the products as well. And yeah. this can, um, you know, potentially be added added to a list platform in the future, which allows DFMs to buy directly from that list 
or through a platform and they don't need to uh, open it and hold it through a direct share brokerage account. Yeah, it is that access perhaps. Um, can, can MCs, can they be wrapped into an endowment and, and are, are they, the, the two parts of the question, the second part is um, allowed in Reg 28 pension RA funds. I imagine that certainly they can, they're listed, obviously they need to be within the rules of the Reg 28, that's fine. What about putting it into an endowment policy? I'm not sure if you, either of you gents uh, have any insights on that. Sure, Simon, so, mean, to be honest, uh, we aren't tax experts, we, yeah. we can't offer <laughs> But yeah, yeah I mean, in, in that sense, I mean, uh, Brendan, I mean, I, I, I don't see why not. It's a listed product. I mean, it absolutely can. Uh, Reg 28, absolutely, yes. Question coming through around mm -hmm. offshore allowances. Uh, I know you touched on this, but this is, although it is offshore, it's it, it's not part of my annual allowance uh, in, in terms of my uh, 11 million I can take offshore. This is done in ZAR, will be bought in ZAR, and my profits and proceeds will also accrue to me in ZAR, correct? Absolutely. So it is a way to get exposure to these kind of companies uh, without using that allowance. Yeah. Um, your, your profits will, your profits or losses will be paid out to you in rands. Um, but obviously, the, the underlying value of the securities is in whatever their currency of denomination is. So okay. for Microsoft, it's dollar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can they be accessed through Easy Equities? Yeah. I mean, any stockbroker. It's a listed product on the. The, the, the exchange, so any stockbroker, you can buy it via the stockbroker. Uh, you absolutely can. Uh, Easy Equities, of course, got some benefits with their fractionals. We'll park there. Um, uh, sorry, and then suddenly the questions start running, rushing in. Uh, question, talking around share buybacks, and i got to say, gents, I, if you'd spoken to me 10 years ago, I would have said share buybacks, the worst thing in the world. I have changed my mind over the last decade, um, a lot of it in the last little while. And, and one of the things, and this was actually a question that was posed to me, is that share buybacks are tax efficient. And, and I agree with that because I don't pay dividend tax. You know, right. a company pays me a dividend, 20% just vanishes off to SARS, or if you're in the US, it goes to the IRS, or wherever the case may be. Um, they're efficient that way. And to your point about Warren Buffett, I remember when he wrote that letter which was maybe eight or so years ago, where he spoke about dividends versus share buybacks. And he said, it's really simple. If you want cash flow, sell some Berkshire Hathaway. I'm never going to pay you a, a, a dividend. The question yeah. comes in is, what about some of those companies that buy back their shares, but then issue stock-based compensation? So the share count actually never <laughs> drops. I'm imagining those sort of companies would be a red flag on your list and, and simply wouldn't cut the mustard because they're using it more just to pay staff rather than sort of generate return. Yeah, Simon, as as, um, as we showed in that chart earlier um, with Apple and with Lowe's, uh, we definitely like to see a net, a decrease in net amount of shares outstanding. Um, so, you know, we, we offer other funds where it's very much growth based and these companies tend to use their share price to issue stock in the form of stock based compensation. However, the companies we're looking at here are large established companies. Um, where stock-based compensation is not really um, doesn't really factor in. Correct. Uh, question yeah, coming. And, and I mean, yeah. Sorry, so just to speak to your point about tax and the tax efficiency um, of share buybacks versus dividends, it, it is going to be an interesting next sort of ten years, uh, particularly in America, with um, a whole bunch of government agencies wanting to potentially look at taxing share buybacks. Yeah. And um, there are a lot of, of very, very powerful people in very powerful places. We are not really happy about the fact that this is a that companies aren't paying much on on, on the repurchase of their own stock, um, and so it has recently changed. It's gone to a one percent tax, I think it is, or it's a tax on only one percent, whatever. But yeah, um, yeah it's going to that, that landscape may well change. Um, but these companies, I think, will have the ability to to change their policy as they see fit. Um, if in the future dividends became a slightly more tax uh, efficient way of returning capital to shareholders, they might be increased the dividends by more. Yeah, no, I take your point on that. And and I mean, all, all legislation has the risk of at some point particularly uh, changing. Adam's asking who carries the risk of currency fluctuations. I mean, th that's part of the process. This AMC will be, the price will be driven by two sets of movers. One is the value of the assets. And then the second is the currencies relative to the czar. So ultimately, that 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 currency impact is going to be carried by by the investor short term. It will be noisy long term. It goes to the six percent number per annum you mentioned. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, nothing to add there. Okay. Uh, what about fees? What's the fees on this product? 
Okay, so fees are made up uh, from a, a, there are a few different fees being taken. We, as the investment manager, are taking 75 basis points, so 0.75%. Uh, and Standard Bank is charging both a, a platform fee and, and, and they are the prime broker as well, uh, charge 35 basis points in total. So we come to a, a total cost of 1.1%. Of okay. Yeah, and which, then which we think is quite attractive within the space. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, if you compare that to a lot of the fees which are being charged by sort of conventional unit trusts, um, it, it's very competitive. Yeah. And, and then, of course, the, the standard brokerage fees, which is between the, the investor and their broker. I've got an alert. I'm struggling with Internet. My camera might die if it does. No one panic. Uh, Pierre's asking, uh, dividends, are you total return? Are you paying dividends, frequency of dividends? And from the dividends are, are being reinvested. And um, we... Quite, quite similarly to, to your comment about Warren Buffett, um, we believe that because these things can trade on the daily um, and they are so easy for investors to trade, if they need an income from this product, um, they can create one themselves um, by, by selling a, sl a small portion of their, of, of their certificates. So at this point in time, uh, no, we're not, we're not paying income and I don't foresee us doing one in, in the future. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, and then Adam, you're asking advantage of buying this instead of buying the underlying shares directly. Uh, Adam, that's always the point with collective investment schemes. You can go and do it yourself or you can let uh, 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 Ross and Ross do it for you and, and pay them the 1.1%. Um, the next question, and I don't know if anyone has the answer to this, how many AMCs are there in our market? I actually honestly don't know. So I, I don't know the, the nominal figure uh, exactly, um, but there are a huge amount which have come online in the last quarter. Um, I think that the number that Standard Bank had done alone was in the 90s. Yeah, um, Standard Bank is the biggest within the market. And uh, if memory serves correctly, there are approximately 200 AMCs uh, listed, listed on the market. So they are a very popular um, structure. Okay, I, I, okay. I, I, I would have guessed a handful, but it turns out I was horribly wrong. Howard's asking if uh, Standard Bank is making a double in the market. I was actually having a look today. They certainly are. Um, but uh, uh, Howard, what I saw there, I mean, and, and, and I, I, ch I chatted with my stockbroker and they said, look, th th there's not much on the double there in terms of, of, of uh, uh, value, but uh, they can either speak to Standard Bank. Um, but what they also said is that what they've seen is that you, 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 do, you do a limit market, limit trade. Uh, you hit them and then they come back and, and trade you out. But certainly the liquidity is there, uh, not a problem. Uh, yeah, I, Howard, I, I'll, yeah. So the, the big point there is is please get your, if, if, whether it's IMC or another AMC, but when you're trading an actively managed certificate, um, in terms of where we are in the trading process now, as I said, these are very new to the JSC, but please just get your, your stockbroker to get a hold of, in, in our case, Standard Bank or whoever the issuing bank is. And they will then trade that. That they will then trade that for you in whatever liquidity you desire. So um, there, there is liquidity. It's Standard Bank's job to make sure that there is daily liquidity for this every day, and they are doing so. And so, if you want to trade more than exists on the double, um, please just get your broker to contact them, and they'll do that for you. And yeah. importantly, they'll purchase it at NAV. Yeah, they'll purchase it at NAV. Yeah. Yes. yes, and that, that's actually a key point. And 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 that was a question that came through. Uh, uh, what price are they trading on on the JSC? They trade at net asset value. Of course, that net asset value is is changing as the shares change, as the currencies move, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it's changing at NAV. Howard, you're asking me about tax. Does SARS regard the AMC as a share? We Ross Ross and I took a decision beforehand that we're going to stay far away from from SARS and tax because that is not our wheelhouse. Um, but the short answer, when I had a quick chat with with with, with folks, is they like ultimately this is around making profit. This is viewed more as a collective investment. This is not some you know crazy structure you've got registered in some island you've never heard of via a, a dodgy thing. <laughs> this is ultimately more than anything it's viewed as a collective investment. Uh, and ladies and gents, with that, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. Um, oh, a last question coming. So. And, and the answer to this, again, Ross and Ross, is not particularly your wheelhouse, but uh, will we see some with sort of different themes and the like around them? I think so. I mean, you know, I, I imagine you guys have probably given some thought to other, uh, other other possibilities as well. Certainly, I think there are going to be other asset managers who are going to look at these and think, this is an interesting take. I think it's a great initiative by the JSC. I completely agree. I think it's a great initiative by the JSC. I mean, and, and you are 100% correct. We... The, the thematic fund that, that, that Ross introduced at the beginning called Wealth Warriors 
um, which focuses on disruptive industries and, mm -hmm. and, and change amongst consumers, um, we are very much considering launching one of those. Um, yeah, we, we, we think it, it, we could find a market for that. Um, and so in terms of different themes and interesting strategies, um, I think this is a great initiative by the JSC, um, which for us is really, is really, really exciting because we can get creative. And I think Ross, oh, we mentioned that we are not tax experts. Uh, so we are consult consulting the tax experts being the South African Reserve Bank. And we've asked them if, it, uh, if these products will be eligible for tax-free savings accounts. So yeah. yeah, so we yet to hear, um, but we we are waiting uh, an answer shortly. And we, have, you know, if that gives the green light, uh, then we'll definitely look to look to launch an AMC linked to that Wealth Warriors product. That's actually a great question. I hadn't thought of tax-free investing. I, I I have I read the act when it came out way ago. I see, I, I see. So so the, the the key restrictions were no performance fees. Um, no derivative product. And that's why most structured products, and there's some big structured product houses in South Africa, uh, at Standard Bank, one of them, those structured products can't fit in, in many cases because they've got a, and the derivative product might be a put, which is giving you downside protection, but that's then yeah. not allowed and no performance fees. As, as I see these, I see no reason why not. Um, although when I spoke to my broker, they were like, oh, they're not sure. I suppose we'll We'll wait on, yeah. on on the powers that be. Brendan, uh, I'm going to do some more digging on that question. Drop me a mail, simon at justonelap.com. Uh, I'm going to do some digging tomorrow, and I will have some more on that. Howard, absolute uh, pleasure. Uh, Brendan, more on tax. Yeah, I, I mean, there's always going to be the the there's a dual tax agreement between us and the US, but there's always there's going to be some drag on that and there is just no avoiding that we see that in the etf space i wrote something on just one lap recently around that um you can go dig around that the, the drag is modest uh it's not nothing and yes we would rather have the money in our accounts but uh that doesn't always work that way uh ladies and gents we are out of time um so well, now we're out of time we're out of questions but we got to be finishing early rather early than late uh ross ross really appreciate that was great i i enjoyed learning more about uh, actively managed certificates i enjoyed learning around the strategy uh i have been as i said slowly over the years been won over to the share buybacks and i know what hated me on them it was anglo i think who did a share buyback at 500 rand back in 2007 and, and that just soured me forever in a day um but when it's binders, up it's different the binders tend to do everything counter cyclical simon <laughs> well that's the, and that's actually a great point about it if you are in a cyclical business you want to do share, back, share buybacks at the bottom but you've got no money uh you want to do them at the top but you don't want to do that because you're going back to the bottom but if you're apple you're not cyclical right i mean i mean at some point apple sold us all seven devices and they've run out of a market but we're a little ways to go there jb absolute pleasure brandon pleasure howard pleasure ladies and gents appreciate your questions uh gents from high street asset management appreciate your time today it was a it was a great presentation learned a ton thank you so much for having us Simon. fantastic Simon. cheers everyone cheers all